Welcome to La Tabula, our family table. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, today, we're going to prepare um, uh, some dishes for you. Uh, and they deviate a bit from our typical Italian meal, where uh, uh, we're borrowing some, some dishes and some recipes from our French neighbors. I'll be making um, a, uh, a roasted beet dish. And uh, Phyllis uh, will be making twice-baked potatoes. The main course for tonight's meal is flounder. I want to say this with a French accent, but it never comes out right. Mounier. It's uh, it, now normally French cooking is a bit fussy, but I love this recipe. I love the simplicity of it. So uh, Nona wouldn't have made it, but if she had heard how simple it was, she she would have been all over this. It's it's a dish cooked in the style of the Miller's wife. Um, and you'll see when we get to it why the miller. So let me start on the beets. When you're preparing beets, golden beets are great, they don't stain. Red beets, Harvard beets, these stain wicked bad. So I like to wear gloves, food handlers gloves. You can get these at the supermarket now. Glad to see that. Uh, and you had a little boo-boo, did you not? I did, and that's another reason. I'm going to be probably wearing a glove because uh, I was trying to do something with a, with a pair of needle nose pliers. And I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it was on my honeydew list. Oh, uh, uh, you know, that list. Have them do too much well, I got, a, I got a wound. I had to stop. I couldn't finish the list. Um, but it's, uh, it's not good to, uh, to uh, prepare food for others when there's a possibility of a little... Uh, I'm not supposed to say b words like blood or pathogens or things like that, so I'm not going to say them, but you, I think you get the gist of it. Okay, two different colored beads. They're going to look nice. I think they're going to look beautiful in the, uh, in the presentation. So let's start uh, with the red beet, and you want to trim off the greens. Be careful. Use a good knife and trim off the root end. Most recipes and most chefs tell you to roast the beets first and then peel them, um, peel them with a sharp knife after they're roasted. Um, I'm following a recipe that I saw on TV, uh, the Barefoot Contessa, and she peeled it raw and, roast and quartered them or halved them and then uh, roasted it. And I, I just like the way that sounded, so I'm going to try it. Hope it comes out good. Hope you enjoy it. So I'm using a regular vegetable peeler, something you would peel your apples or potatoes with. And we're taking off all the skin. I did wash them. <laughs> yeah, well. Let me do them. I'm much faster at peeling than you are. I just am. It's just a skill that I I'll let have. you do the other one. How's okay, that? I'm going to see. <laughs> it's always a contest. <laughs> Did I tell you I was professionally trained as a chef? Mm -hmm. Phyllis thinks mm -hmm. she's going to be faster than me. She usually is. Okay, this one's not too big. I'm going to have it. Do you want to do the other one? Sure. You're going to cut? Don't cut yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm left-handed, so bear with me, folks. There we go. And then I just take the peeler, as I said, left-handed. I do short little whoop whoop. A slippery bead. Uh, I think that's good that size. Okay. So there is about oh I don't know twelve beads in here maybe fourteen I've forgotten how many we uh, we bought. I'm going to toss it with some extra virgin olive oil somewhere between two and four tablespoons for this size. I'm going to sprinkle a little bit of uh, champagne vinegar. Uh, you could use a fruity vinegar. Uh, I think uh, 
the Barefoot Contessa used a raspberry vinegar, which I think would be very nice and quite French. Uh, that was, what, a tablespoon or so? Mm -hmm. Oranges and beets uh, have, a, have a good uh, taste uh, affinity, so the juice of one orange, approximately, one large orange. Salt, I've got some kosher salt here. I'm going to use about a teaspoon. This needs a lot of salt. And some uh, fresh thyme from Phyllis's garden. Uh, I pulled the leaves off the, uh, off the stem. This is, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe a couple of teaspoons or so. So I'm going to sprinkle this on. And that, my dear friends, is it, other than tossing. So that the oil and the salt, that wasn't it, pepper, I forgot the pepper. So what would you say, about uh, 20, 20 twists of a pepper grinder or so? That's all to taste, it depends on how you like it. You could use, whoops, get in there you. And this is going to go into a preheated 400 degree oven for about 40 minutes. And, uh, or until the, uh, uncovered by the way, or until the, uh, the beets are fork tender and that means they're ready. Uh, yeah, it, you could, about halfway through or a couple of times during the roasting period, uh, it's, it would be good to save your spatula and go in and give them a toss so that they, uh, they crisp up evenly in the oven. So I'm going to take this to the oven. All right, again, I'm going to start assembling the strawberry tart that we're going to have for dessert. Now, I bought in the supermarket a dough that comes in a tube, it comes in a box, you can buy it in the dairy case somewhere, um, and it comes rolled up like this in a little sleeve. So all you have to do is take it out of the refrigerator when you're ready to use it, let it sit out for about 10 or 15 minutes, unroll it, and if it looks like it's not going to be quite the size and you need it to be a little bit bigger, which I think I do, I just put a little flour on my granite top, move it over, and with a little rolling pin you can do the correction pretty easily. Just give it a little, we'll just flare out the ends just a little bit. Doesn't need a whole lot. And really that's all you need to do. Now I'm going to take it, fold it in half. Brush off some of that excess flour. You don't want that on there. It makes it tough and doesn't taste very good. Thank you. And we're just gonna put this right on the tart pan. And this is a really good quality, I would say, if you're gonna buy a tart pan, spend the money a little bit and buy yourself a good quality tart pan, a non-stick one, I think you'll be going to press into the sides around the fluted edges of the tart pan. And pastry dough is pretty, pretty forgiving, so if you get a little tear, you just have to push it together with your fingers, and you'll be okay. Like that. Now, the next little trick that I like to do is I like to give it a couple of pricks with a fork. Pastry dough tends to bubble up a little bit when you put it in the oven. Well, that will do it. Then I'm taking some foil, and this particular one is a non-stick foil, and I'm going to put it the, the um, matte side down, the non-shiny side down, against the dough. I'm just going to press it in. And then, because I don't have any of those, what they call pastry beads, is that what they call them? Pie weights. Pie weights. I use beans. This particular kind of a bean, this one happens to be a lima bean, but you could really use any kind of bag of dried beans. And I'm just pouring, just for the weight, I'm just going to pour it in the bottom and spread it out. And that's probably all, maybe half the bag is all I need. And you do this why? 
Well, it keeps the it keeps the dough down. It keeps a little pressure on it, and it bakes evenly, and so it doesn't puff up. I think the heat does something to the pastry dough, and it kind of bubbles bubbles up and doesn't work very well. Pie, pie dough has um, it gets its flakiness from layers of butter and uh, or lard, if you prefer, and flour, and so there's always some air trapped in there during the and, and the water and the butter and the heat causes that to steam up and expand and could cause the bottom of the pie crust to uh, to rise up. Now that I've got the beans in the pie shell, I'm going to take it and put it on a 450 oven for about 10 minutes. Keep an eye on it because you don't want it to burn. So now the potato is baked. And I tested it with a fork before I took them out, let them cool off a little bit. But if they're hot and you're needing to work quickly, you can take a, an oven mitt, you can wrap it in a little cloth underneath if it's still too hot to handle. These are cooled off. So I'm just going to scoop them, being careful not to go too close to the skin, and just scoop them out into a bowl. And then you just put them back into the cookie sheet. And now we're ready to mix the filling and thus the twice baked potato. So here's our bowl of potatoes and to which I'm going to add about a cup or so of sour cream. And I've got some butter and I just brought it to room temperature. Actually it was so warm today so it kind of really kind of super melted just for some creaminess. Then I'm going to take some salt and pepper, probably about a half a teaspoon or so of salt, and maybe a quarter teaspoon of pepper into the mixture. And then I'm going to take some, I used a cheddar, but you can use a three, they sell three cheese cheddar that's already grated. This is probably about a cup or so. And I'm going to reserve a little bit of it for the very, very top after I take them out of the oven, just because I think they're going to look kind of nice. So I'll leave that much in, maybe a quarter of a cup. And then I picked some chives this morning from my garden, chopped them up, I'm going to add those because I think it gives it a really nice flavor and great, great color. And you can leave a little bit of this as well at the top for a garnish after, after they're all done. So set that aside. Now I'm just going to mix this all together but what I'm going to do is use an electric mixer. I think it would just make it a lot easier to do that. I would have probably, if I had one like my mother did, an old-fashioned potato masher. But I don't have one, so I'm going to just use my mixer on a low to medium setting. I'm not going to whip it like I would do whipped potatoes. I'm just going to get it moving around enough so that every, all the mixtures are blended together. And I like it a little bit chunky. I don't necessarily like it too smooth. But I mean, it's really as you like it and as you think your family would like it. I love the philosophy. Cooking needs to be fun. It doesn't have to look perfect. Sometimes I end up marrying almost as much as uh, is in the bowl, but that's okay. Right. What do you think? Uh, that looks perfect. You think so? Yeah. You want to taste? <laughs> yeah, yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. Delicious, huh? And let me just say one more thing. If you feel like your mixture is a little too dry, you can add a little chicken stock or a little milk, and I might just add a little bit of cream to this. So, so I'm going to add just a little half and half. You could use milk. If you have a little bit of chicken stock, you could add that. I'm just looking to just get it a little wetter and creamier. So I think that was maybe an eighth of a cup that I added. I'm just going to move it around in the bowl just a little bit. It's just going to make it easier to spoon it back into the shells and I think it's going to end up being a really lovely texture. So now I'm just ready to stuff these little puppies and I'm going to go with a good heaping spoonful and then when I'm done with that I'm going to top them off with a little more of the 
cheddar cheese and a little bit of the chives. And I'm going to bake them for probably in a 400 oven for maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And for the final touch before I put the potatoes in the oven to bake for about 15 minutes at about 400, I'm just going to put the rest of the shredded cheddar on top. And you can be watching this just, just until the cheese is melted and the potato filling is warm enough. The traditional dish that the French do is called uh, sole mounier. I don't, you know, don't trust my French accent or pronunciation. Very simple, butter, lemon, parsley in the, is the sauce. And uh, I couldn't find affordable fresh sole, but the supermarket had a good sale on flounder, which is a cousin to the sole, a little larger, and uh, so I picked some up. So, a little flour. We're just going to dust the uh, the sole with with uh, with flounder. I'm, I'm going to. We're going to dust the flounder with flour. I think. Okay, I'm going to put my gloves on. We're going to season the. Um, the flour with a little salt and a little, I think I'm going to use white pepper um, because the, the fish is, it's a white fish and it doesn't get very brown the, the way it's cooked here. So white, white pepper will uh, make it a little bit less, you'll, you'll see fewer specks of black pepper. It's an odd shape, huh? That's a long, skinny fish. Always smell it. it smells really fresh. Just a light dusting. Remember the, uh, the miller's wife, they, uh, they sold their flour, so they didn't use too much. It's a light dusting just to, uh, just to help crust it up a bit. And it's a, it's a thin piece of fish that's going to cook very quickly. Um, and I want to decide which piece is going to be on top, and that's the piece I'm going to put down first because that'll brown the best. So you take a look at the fish. That's not an attractive side. That's more attractive. So shake off the loose flour. Get that attractive side down. I should say I did, had to do a little work with this with this fish first because um, there were there, there were quite a few bones uh, along along a line in there and so I had to cut that line out and that's it was just too much to have to pick all the bones out so that's why these are skinny uh, fillets I really cut every fillet in half so I could eliminate the uh, eliminate the bones that were there. I'm going to turn the heat up on this thing. I'm going to set this aside for the next batch. This is going to have to be cooked in batches. You don't want to overcrowd your pan. All right. There's my golden pie crust. I didn't need the beans. So you can eliminate that step if you want. I think it looks too much. I'll let that cool down a little bit and I'll assemble the tar. It does look good. In the meantime, I'm going to pop these twice baked stuffed potatoes in for about 15 minutes while Mario finishes cooking the rest of the fish. This is the perfect tool for this. Flounder, sole, they're very delicate fish. They want to break apart, so you have to, eh, got to treat it a bit gently. Otherwise, it's going to break up on you. Oh, it's in the center of the heat. All that's in the pan was butter. Got the butter for tonight's meal from uh, Stillman's Dairy Farm in Lunenburg. His mother makes it in an ice cream maker. How cool is that? You've heard me talk about that. We interviewed Garrett Stillman for our show. These two on the end are done. 
I'm going to transfer them to the platter here. And if you're going to cook fish fillets, get one of these long, longer spatulas. They're specific for fish. Uh, well, not true specific for fish. You could use them. Oh, see? That's what I didn't want to do, break it. Um, it's going to taste good anyway. And that's it. Now we're going to uh, make the sauce in uh, using the same pan. Um, and I didn't say this earlier, but if you're going to cook with, if you're going to cook fish and eggs, you non-stick pans is really the way to go. Uh, it's perfect. So keep that in mind. So we've got um, we've got the fish bits in there. This is the juice from about uh, oh two two and a half lemons. I'm going to put a little bit of that in. That's going to sizzle when I put it in. Actually, I'm not going to put all of it because I, I don't really know how that's going to work out. And we also need some uh, butter. Felicia, would you mind getting the butter for me, please? And you know, I'm going to zest a little bit of the, the lemon zest. Get, you really need a, a, one of these microplanes. It's a, the lemon zest adds such a nice, rich Sparkle of lemon flavor. This is one that uh, that I juiced already. I took the juice out of it. The French would have clarified the butter. That is, melt it. I don't know if you can see the inside of the pan. Take the foam off the top. They consider that an impurity. And then there are solids, uh, milk solids. It's all good. We're putting a lot of butter because we got quite a bit of fish to. Uh, to serve up to the, the, the volunteers that are helping us out with the filming tonight. So I'm going to get it all in there, except for the solids at the bottom. I think it could use a little more lemon juice. Could use some salt, too. I'm going to go with my kosher salt. Do you have time to it now, or is that just a garnish on the Um. No, uh, parsley. Hey, do you want to chop some parsley for me? Thank you, my dear. A little bit. Let the uh, the, the uh, lemon juice boil down a, a tad, and uh, then simply add some chopped parsley and just spoon this over the uh, over the fish. And that's all there is to it. It's really it's a simple dish. That's why I love it. Strawberry tart. I made a pastry cream ahead of time. I had to make it ahead of time because it needed to uh, cool after it cooked. But um, this pastry cream I made with half and half eggs and a little beeper in the background. Sugar, vanilla, and flour to thicken it up. And it's been cooked because you need to cook it for the flour to thicken and uh, make it all nice. You think enough? Oh yeah, I like a nice, so I like a nice thick more? layer of uh, pastry cream. That looks great, perfect. Okay. We're going to uh, now just kind of decorate this thing with fruit flies, no, uh, strawberries. You can take the stems off couple of different ways. You can buy one of these um, one of these little gadgets here. It's a it's called a strawberry huller. It's got teeth on it and a little round thing and that uh, helps to take the strawberries out or you can use a peering knife. So I'm going to cut these in half and now here comes where the uh, the artwork uh, comes in. Maybe you can help me fill us. That would be nice. I would like that. All right. So you have some design in mind? I'm just going to do uh, strawberries. You can get it. as creative as you want with the, the 
with the strawberry placement. I've seen some people do it this way, and then I've seen them go kind of in a pinwheel. All right, so we're throwing, here you go. See those? So we're throwing uh, design to, uh, to the wind here, and we're just plopping them down because, because it's getting late and we're hungry. Come on, you can't give up now. There's going to be a final... Uh... I have to check my potato. Oh, okay. I like, to, I like to pack the strawberries in tighter than he does, so that's what I'm doing. And I, I bought some strawberry jam. I bought the jam because it was seedless. You don't really need to have seedless with strawberry because their seeds are so small. That's true. You know, you look with at the raspberries. Yes, I you look at the so. strawberries underneath it, all <laughs> coated with seeds. And we're just going to put a layer of this on top, and it's supposed to make it glisten. Ta-da! Okay. Well, let's get the let's get the other courses out and uh, get ready to uh, feed the uh, the volunteers here. We took our passports out. We went from Italy to France to copy one of the, to steal one of their recipes. Flounder, how's it pronounced? Manier. That's what you told me. Manier. 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 And it's a simple dish. Typically sole. We didn't have sole. We used flounder, sole's cousin. The sauce which is the real key to Monier, is uh, butter, lemon juice, and parsley, cooked together with some salt and pepper. We're just going to spoon this over. Mm. Sorry, Dr. Goodman, I had a physical yesterday. Dr. Goodman complained about my weight. You should be cutting down on some of that. Uh, some of those high calorie foods that I see you cooking on TV. I said, yeah, sure. What's the copay on that? <laughs> oh, that looks good. This is going to be good. You're going to love this. It smells wonderful. Flounder, Munir, twice baked potatoes, Phyllis made with cheddar cheese, sour cream. Stuff from her garden, little twigs, no, chives from her garden. Beets, roasted beets, uh, recipe I stole from uh, the Barefoot Contessa. Um, it's got orange juice, um, uh, uh, champagne vinegar, sorry, forgot the, the word. Champagne vinegar, extra virgin olive oil, salt and pepper, and thyme. And <laughs> the disaster. <laughs> of a fresh strawberry tart. Uh, it's going to taste good. It's not a beautiful tart. It well, was have to eat it with a spoon. Yeah, well, that's, that's all right. We've done that before. But thank you for, thank you for joining uh, our program tonight and watching. We hope you, uh, you had as much fun as we did. We, we had a lot of fun tonight. And uh, don't be afraid to try these. They're really simple. And even if they don't come out the way you see them uh, in a magazine, it's still going to taste good, so try it and enjoy it. Uh, we appreciate you. You're uh, you're watching La Tabla. Check us out on Facebook, YouTube, all of those things. Uh, don't forget, you know, come in, comment. If you got questions, ask questions. Uh, we have someone who's going to be helping us put uh, put some of the recipes up on YouTube, uh, and uh, for, so that you can uh, have an easier time of making these dishes at home. But uh, uh, until until next time, buon appetito and ciao. Ciao.